Well, welcome today. How are we? On this Wednesday. Decent Wednesday? All right. Okay. It's a little, little wet out, so it should be fine. All right. If you got outside activity, just make sure you're properly attired and all that stuff. I know my son, he's he's got a, a class this week at the University of Minnesota. It's um, not quite summer session, but today seems appropriate. He is um, going to be playing around in wetlands, so he's he's going to be out there in, in, in being wet. So perfect, perfect day for it, I guess, with that regards. All right. So here we are. Uh, we are continuing with the civil rights uh, theme. Uh, continue with that. And you have been looking at legal challenges. One thing I want you to be aware of, so hopefully you're dialing it in, is if um, you are missing, I don't think too many people are missing stuff, but if you are, we know the end of the trimester 3.2 is getting very close. I know my, my seniors are telling me that. Uh, almost daily that at the end is getting near and the end is getting near and we are going to have four summative assessments um, this uh, trimester and so far I believe we have done a couple of them so you want to make sure that you are getting those done and we'll be having uh, two more come up so uh, with that being said June 2nd I think that's what I have on my my board over there June 2nd is if you got anything missing out there, let's let's take care of the missing stuff because we know that last week of the trimester, you will be turning in your your iPads. And, and so um, hopefully you've got your missing stuff taken care of before that happens. All right. So I just want to make you aware of that. All right. We have been looking at, or you have been at looking at some Supreme Court cases. Uh, the legal challenges to uh, segregation, and you should be finding out that these cases are happening over multiple decades, but one that is kind of the what we call the landmark case uh, was Plessy versus Ferguson, but equally important, uh, another landmark case that kind of takes it down is Brown versus Board of Education, important. All right, and so I have a video clip here that's going to look at what is uh, really uh, kind of the goal of looking at legal challenges is this idea of educational equality. And Brown versus Board of Education is going to really help uh, put that in motion. There'll be some test cases prior to it, but this one really kind of gets it put in motion. But then what does it look like? All right, because that's another thing in doing this activity is uh, looking at this idea of how is um, these cases impacting education. And this might help answer some of one of those big historical questions as well. So let's, let's dial it in as we watch this little clip here. Let me mute. Brown versus Board of Education was really the most significant of a series of Supreme Court cases that dealt with inequality in education. And what had existed there since the 19th century had been a separate school system, one for whites and one for blacks. And this was allowable under the Constitution because of the Supreme Court decision in the late 19th century, Plessis versus Ferguson. The principle that was outlined in Plessy versus Ferguson was the principle of separate but equal. And of course, what we know now is that those facilities were never equal. Before Brown, and even for years following Brown, there were dramatic differences in the quality of schooling. Black schools might run three or four months a year. The quality of the curriculum was really limited. 
And these were the facts that were brought forward. It was over a series of, of years that the court heard arguments and then re-arguments. It issued its decision in May of 1954, written by the Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren. It was a unanimous decision, and that was very important. And they wanted to show that the Supreme Court was speaking with a single voice on this very important issue. Now, just because the Supreme Court declared uh, that separate and unequal was no longer constitutional didn't mean that states were just going to suddenly change what they were doing. The immediate impact of the Brown decision was very little, very little actually changed. It was a year later that they issued a decision, it was called Brown II in 1955, that laid out when this was to be implemented. And they used a famous phrase there, with all deliberate speed, which was kind of a mystifying phrase. People didn't know exactly what it meant, but it seemed to imply that it could be worked out over a long period of time. And so southern states ended up taking a long period of time to work this out. And many of them didn't desegregate their schools at all. Just to pass a court case declaring segregation illegal um, is one thing, but bringing it to life really took courage. Someone had to actually agree to walk in to the schools where previously they had not been allowed to go. Probably the most widely recognized or prominent that would be the Little Rock Nine. Nine students who were some of the brightest, smartest students anywhere in Little Rock, and they wanted to enroll in Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, in September of 1957. There were protests. The governor, Orville Faubus, actually called in the Arkansas National Guard to block the way of these nine students from entering. And it became a showdown. There would be throngs of, of white Southerners there protesting, shouting slurs at them, shouting all kinds of obscenities at them. But Dwight Eisenhower sends federal troops to Little Rock to actually uh, protect and guard the nine students who go to school. And so they are admitted and they spend that year in school. They had to show great restraint in not responding to the harassment of their fellow students. People would yell at them, people would not try to knock the the trays out of their hand in the, in the cafeteria. And they knew if they yelled back or if they hit back at their fellow students, they would be expelled. This would be exactly what the white folks wanted because it would, it would give them an excuse to, to kick them out of school. To have the state police or the National Guard having to escort you into the building, to have to worry about uh, what you would experience or encounter once there. It's not the most conducive environment to learning, and yet, um, and yet they did. Another place in which the desegregation of Southern schools was particularly difficult was in the city of New Orleans in 1960. And one of the most remarkable characters to emerge out of that conflict in a young girl called Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges' mother was determined that she would go to the local white school in New Orleans. And there's a famous story that she tells that she remembers showing up at school the first day and she was accompanied by these large U.S. Marshals. And there was such a there was such energy and activity and there were people yelling and screaming and she thought it was a Mardi Gras parade. There were many other acts of courage all over the country uh, and here in Georgia, both in our uh, high schools uh, as early as 1961 when four high schools agreed to integrate right here in Atlanta to um, the integration of our colleges and universities here in Georgia. So the middle to late 1960s were in one sense tumultuous, but in another 
really important in terms of breaking the kind of the barriers of race in our schools. The kind of courage that was um, exercised by young people and their families to be the ones who would be out front um, in trying to bring integration to life, I think, is really remarkable. All right, usually what I always do at the end of these video clips is uh, look for, um, you know, if you got any reactions or um, any thoughts, comments about, about this. So um, Brown versus Board of Education is big. It's a big decision. Uh, we look at, you know, when you look at the Supreme Court decision itself, um, did anyone uh, figure out, find out uh, what was the decision? Yesterday, I talked about the importance of a ruling in the case like Plessy versus Ferguson. It was seven, uh, one, uh, seven in favor, one against. That's a big decision. Uh, in the case of Brown versus Board of Education, it was unanimous, nine zero. That's huge. That's a huge message. Uh, the Warren Court, and uh, the Warren Court will be considered a court that's very active, not only in civil rights, but in some other cases as well, maybe legal rights, uh, those who are also uh, perhaps uh, incarcerated uh, uh, will also be impacted by the war in court, like uh, in case of Miranda rights and uh, the right to attorneys, all that stuff. Uh, 9-0 was a huge decision. But, what was the, but what's the impact of that? Or uh, making the decision, that's one thing, but what's really the hard work now? What's the hard work? It was hard getting there, but what is maybe some of the harder work that has to happen? And the video clip was hitting on it. Those at home or here. What? Actually doing it, actually going through with it. So again, this is where we talk about, okay, you can make all the rulings. Now you have to execute on it. Yeah, you gotta get some people who are actually gonna say, yeah, I'm gonna to go to the school. And then you also have schools begin that process. And uh, it's gonna take more cases, isn't it? It's gonna take more cases. The Little Rock Nine, I think about the Little Rock Nine. Um, they're your age. They're your age. They're 15, 16, 17 year olds. Think of yourself, and and you, you, know, you don't have to answer that question, but I mean, do you get do you do you got that courage that those individuals had? I mean, you saw just in that little clip what they have to put up with. Um, similar to uh, Ruby Ridges, um, they have to be escorted every day into the building. Every day. Not by U.S. Marshals, but by armed soldiers every day. Imagine uh, the yellow limo doesn't show up to pick you up to take you to the to school. Um, up comes uh, the military vehicle, and you go, and then you walk into the school. But the military isn't there with them all the time. So when they do go to gym class, when they do go to lunch. Uh, they are going to experience the taunts. So Ernest, Ernest Green will be the first of the Little Rock Nine to graduate from, from high school. And um, uh, it, I think it would be extraordinary to have at your graduation um, Martin Luther King Jr. in the, in the crowd. And that would be huge. Um, and he did show up to Ernest Green's uh, graduation. Now, one thing that we also see about the civil rights movement in, in, in many cases, not only in, 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 in the schools, I mean, the schools are the battlegrounds. I mean, it's the bottom line, they are the battleground, is that it is young people. Young people are involved in the civil rights movement. 
uh, teenagers, those that are in their 20s. Uh, yes, you are going to have some older people being involved in the civil rights movement. But really, realistically, the civil rights movement, just like the youth protest movement, may, there's, the young people are very active. And again, why in some cases? There's so many of them. They are baby boomers as well. So um, that has a role here. So when we talk about impact, again, in the case of Brown versus Board of Education, it does open the door. But now you got to do something with that door being opened. Not only is it hard in the public schools, uh, public high schools and elementaries and, and junior highs, but colleges as well. It's not going to be easy. Um, James Meredith, 1960, will be the first at the University of Mississippi. You know, after that, then other schools are going to open up. University of Minnesota will be one of the first uh, schools that will uh, that will have um, African Americans uh, play on their football team, and it's not until the '60s. All right, and so here's an example of a school not in the South where this is happening. All right, and so so much of the civil rights movement is born out of segregation in the South. But we also have to think of the other types of segregation that exists, whether it's de facto or de jure. What you see with Brown versus education is taking on de jure, and then you have the unwritten stuff. Um, that's the de facto. If I think of, you know, I my, my first experience in public school is uh, 1972. And um, prior to that, I was in a Head Start program. So I could even say probably 1970, 71 is my first experience in school. <laughs> I've been in school ever since. That's a long time. Uh, but um, being, being a product of the great society programs and stuff like that, um, I've experienced perhaps education different than perhaps, you know, my parents and even maybe some of my older siblings as a result of it. I look at my kindergarten class at Jefferson Elementary. It's a very diverse, diverse class. Um, if I grew up in a different part of the United States, it, that might have been different. All that. Okay. So um, with that, uh, any questions about this? Any questions related to that? Okay, so like I said, um, uh, well, one, this assignment is due today. And I know some of you've got it done, and so that's great. Uh, and so uh, if you are got it done, then of course, then you, you work on uh, something else for a different class. Uh, or uh, if you're missing some stuff, let's get that, that taken care of, because I did mention that we are getting near the end here. So if there's no questions related to the legal challenges of, uh, of segregation, then I will give you the rest of the hour to work on this, please. And um, we'll go from there, okay? So those at home, stay on if you have questions or exit. Those here, let's, let's just work on it. 